muted. To introduce myself. So in case you don't know me very well, I am Glenn and uh, I did my doctoral training at UNC in epidemiology. Never finished the dissertation, but then went on from there. Uh, while there, I taught at Duke Medical School and UNC School of Public Health in epidemiology and advanced analytics. And, uh, and have been working in the pharmaceutical world for a bunch of years since then. Uh, my current role, I'm Senior Director of Commercial Epidemiology Analytics, uh, and, and including a variety of things, including forecasting disease trends globally, as well as treatment dynamics, diagnosis dynamics uh, for a variety of therapeutic areas, mostly concentrating on chronic diseases, chronic illnesses, but also um, uh, I spent two years as the epidemiologist on staff at the Infectious Disease Clinic uh, at UNC Chapel Hill when I was down there. Um, all right, so let us start talking. Hey, Ken, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. All right, but you don't have anything, any questions you can see yet, correct? Is that right? No, I don't. All right, let me just email some to you and then you can talk. So on the phone uh, with us is Ken. Uh, Ken, can you introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Ken Kaiser. I'm a fourth year medical student at the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, going on to residency at Kessler for physical medicine and rehabilitation next year. Um, so I think my interest here is also in long term pulmonary rehab for people that maybe end up having an ICU stay with COVID 19 and then get over it, or, you know, just long term issues with um, pulmonary rehab associated with this. Um, yeah. Great. All right, can people on the phone hear us okay? Yes. And Mike, can you hear us? Yeah, All right. everyone's muted right now, so it's just you, because otherwise there's too much background noise. So oh, if people have a question that are on the app, they, they should uh, either type it in or click raise your hand, and we can unmute their line. Oh, I see there's a bunch of questions. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. Oh, it's mostly people saying, I can hear you, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay, that's great. <laughs> All right, if you have questions, why don't we do it on Facebook? Because that could be the easiest way to do it. Just uh, include your questions there. All right, so um, why don't I get started? Well, let me email some of these to Ken, and then Ken, we can have this more of like a conversation as opposed to me just talking for two hours. So um, let me do that. Hey, Glenn, you, do you want me to tell you if someone's got a question here on the app? Oh, yeah, something? that sounds great. Here. All right, we're just figuring out the questions. Okay. And Ken, let me just get your info. All right, Glenn, I opened up the line. Someone has a question. Uh, Lorna. You should okay, be able to. Great. All right, great. I'm just doing one thing, just forwarding this to a friend. So let's see, so Ken is on the phone. I'm forwarding him some questions so we can make this more conversational. Um, all right, Ken. All right, so Lor okay, so let's get started. Um, first, so I don't know if Greg Rosenberg is on the phone, but, um, but I'll start there because he had a good question about dogs. A lot of us have dogs. And so the question is, can dogs, um, uh, do they have a risk of getting, co of getting the virus itself, uh, so SARS-CoV-2, or um, can they transfer it to people? And so that's kind of interesting. So in order for 
the epidemic to evolve the way that it did, there had to be two mutations, not just one. The first mutation had to enable it to move from the original species, which was likely to be a bat. Uh, there was also another possible species that it could have jumped from as well, I think an anteater or something, but most likely it was a bat. Um, and from the and so that would, would be the first thing. So if it jumped from the bat to a person, then that's one mutation to enable the person to get sick. Then it required a second mutation to be able to jump from human to human. And so that's seen as typically uh, in the medical community is like two mutations required. And so that, and, and that happens fairly quickly, we think, over the course of like two weeks or so uh, back in like December or, or, or so, maybe November, December is when it made that second jump. Um, so the same thing would happen, have to happen for dogs. So for right now there is evidence that dogs can be infected. Uh, so in the literature, there have been multiple uh, citations of, do of individual dogs, with mostly case studies of dogs having uh, virus in their blood. It's been demonstrated with PCR analysis, so they found the virus, but I don't know that they've looked for antibodies in the, in the dogs themselves. Um, among the dogs that have typically been looked at, they were in the veterinary hospital anyway for other things, and so the dogs were all old. So for instance, they, you had like a 17 year old dog. And so when the dog died, it was 17 years old, it was already very old. Um, it wasn't clear, they weren't allowed, the, the owners wouldn't let the people do the autopsies and so they didn't know what was going on within the dog. So right now we know that that first mutation uh, was there or, or at least it's that, that it, a dog can get infected. It's unclear right now, there didn't seem to be any symptoms associated with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the dogs. So right now, it doesn't seem like dogs can get sick from the virus. And also right now, it doesn't seem like dogs can spread it to people. And so there's two components, two ways in which potentially a dog could spread it to people. One way would be if the dog is infected and then licks you or, or, uh, you touch, or licks your hand and then you touch your face. And so that way doesn't seem to be the case right now. Um, so, so veterinary hospitals are, are saying, you know, you should just uh, practice just regular, uh, I guess maybe increased hygiene during this time and just wash your hands more frequently if, if you think your dog might have been exposed. Um, the second way that a dog could, could uh, transfer the virus is if you are, uh, pet, if, the, if you're petting the dog and your dog maybe wanders outside to a neighbor's house and if your neighbor has uh, that is infected with the virus, and the neighbor pets the dog and then comes back into your house, can you get the virus by petting the fur after your neighbor who was sick pet the fur, even though you didn't touch the neighbor yourself? And so the answer is yes, possibly, but again, there's no evidence to confirm this yet. Um, but I wouldn't rule that out as a possibility, depending on uh, how sick the neighbor was or, or things like that. So in, in that sense, I, I would just, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but what I would do is, is after petting your dog and whatever, I wouldn't touch your face and so I would wash your hands. And, uh, and so that would probably be fine. Um, but, but if you do allow your dog to go outside during this time and you do fear that your dog might be pet by a neighbor who is positive, uh, maybe your dog shouldn't sleep on your bed with you during this time. All right, um, next question. Unless, Ken, do you have any follow-up on that? Uh, no. All right. Did you get the email I sent you? Yeah. Do you want me to ask you another questions from there? Yeah, that sounds great. I prefer to be more conversational instead of me just talking randomly for an hour. Sure, yeah. So this is drawing from questions people have. Um, what do you think about young kids having play dates? And when do you think it will be okay for them to have it if you think that's kind of just an absolute no-go right now? Yeah, so, so here's the question about play dates. Because um, this is a big issue for people who their, their kids are no longer at school. A lot of people think, well, kids are at really low risk. Should we be able to have play dates? And so, first of all, so, right, so instead of thinking about kids, we really need to be thinking about households in which the kids live. So, even if your kids are at low risk, if you live with a grandparent in the house, for instance, or someone older or someone with comorbidities with higher risk, you really need to be concerned about not having someone who might have been exposed to some to, to someone with the virus coming into your house. Um, I've seen so so right now. I'm not intending to give for anything in this discussion, either medical advice or policy advice. 
but there's a good chance we could be under lockdown through the end of May. Um, and so this question is going to come up more and more, and people are going to have to choose their own, uh, I, I guess, think for themselves in terms of how they proceed. So what I'd like to do is just give you ideas in terms of what the epidemiologists are thinking about as we're designing the policy choices and this kind of stuff. And we're still, the epidemiology community is still debating all this stuff because it's, it's tough to make a policy recommendation for everyone when your particular case might be different. And so here goes. Um, some epidemiologists, so, so a lot of this, when we're talking about the spread of infections, actually the, the best epidemiology studies on this actually comes from sexually transmitted diseases. And so if you have a, um, a, an, if you have a, a relationship with an individual person, that person, whoever they had relationships with, any one of them could have been infected. So even if that one person you have a relationship with only had a relationship with one other person, all the whole universe of people that other third party had a relationship with could have infected that one person that you had a relationship with. So the same thing goes with plating. So that means that say you are uh, in your 30s or you're, you're a couple in your 30s, you have young kids, and you want to know if you could have a neighbor come and play over uh, and the neighbor is in the same situation. Also, the parents are maybe in their, in their 30s, late 30s, and they have young kids. Neither of you have been in, uh, out of the house for a couple weeks, or for a few weeks maybe. Um, should you be allowed? So let's take a step back because this is a little bit complicated. So our best understanding of this disease is that on average, most people who are going to become symptomatic become symptomatic within five days. So the incubation period is typically around five days. Almost all people who ever become symptomatic do so within two weeks. So even if people don't get infected with or don't show symptoms within the first five days, there's a longer tail in terms of when people could, could show symptoms. So two weeks is thought of as probably the limit in terms of if people don't have symptoms within that time, um, then they're probably not going to get symptoms after that time on, in general. Um, and so what this means is that after we're in lockdown for two weeks, if no one in either household has had symptoms for two weeks of, of anything related, and right now the symptoms vary. So people with symptoms might include anything from just a mild headache to the typical ones we thought about in terms of having a sore throat or a cough, uh, although that's not exclusive. So a lot of people don't have those symptoms. Um, other symptoms that people have are diarrhea or, um, or, or things that are not typically associated with this. I, I can get into some other things, including heart uh, issues and stuff that people have. Um, but so if you have no health issues that are different over two weeks, and I would say, say I'm to err on the side of, of caution and maybe three weeks, then, and you have not been outside of the house in that three week period in either household, then at that point, it, a, a, a responsible adult could probably make the decision if you had a neighbor's kid and neither household has been out and there is no high risk individual in that in either household, that it's probably okay to have a play date. And, and this is going against what the typical policy recommendations are going to be. And I'll share with you the reasons why um, the policy recommendations are different. All right, so the first reason is, you know, typically, one person or more people are leaving the house to go food shopping or to do other errands. So it's not really a quarantine if you can like go and, and go food shopping whenever you want. And so that's, so that's problematic because if you go food shopping, then it resets the clock. And so if you go and you spend an hour going food shopping and go and there's a bunch of people in the supermarket, then whoever goes food shopping might have been exposed during that time. And if you're, if no one in your household went food shopping, but then the per, your neighbor's household, someone in their household went food shopping, then they might be at risk in their household and then could put you at risk in your household. So that really should weigh on you in terms of our uh, uh, willingness to have sort of these places. The second thing is um, if you have someone in the household, again, going back to this idea, if you have someone in the household who is at high risk, then the math changes dramatically. Because if it's a low risk, like 
people in their 30s, 40s, generally the adults, with younger kids who are like, say, under 20, then the risks generally are quite low. But if you have an 80-year-old grandparent living with you or a parent living with you, then their risk is quite high. And so you probably wouldn't want to have a play date at all for a long period. Um, I mean, because the problem is you could think of it, well, what if, what if you don't have the play date at your house with your, where your, uh, the older member is there? What if you let the young kid go to your neighbor's house and have the play date over there? The problem is still the same problem because then the kid could go over to your neighbor's house, get infected there, even if the risk is very low, and then bring it back into your house with grandma. And so you probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, so having said that, let me, hey, Mike, can you open it up? I don't know if there's any follow-up questions or if that is um, sufficient for that. So, so Mike, if you open up the, the line to anyone who wants to ask a follow-up question online, or Ken, if you have a follow-up question. Sure. Mine would just be to kind of take it back to basics. We talked about two, I think, primary means of spreading the disease, or rather the primary is by respiratory droplets, but now we know that there is some fecal shedding of the virus. Um, so there is a fecal oral route. I don't know if you just wanted to kind of touch, you know, touch on that. I know there supposedly is a difference in the um, symptoms that people manifest based on the route. They're thinking that if you contract it from a fecal oral route, which is to say someone went to the bathroom, the virus was shed in their feces, they didn't adequately wash their hands, and then they touch something that you touch and you touch your mouth, that you manifest more gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, but it can still manifest to the respiratory symptoms, the shortened breath, cough, sore throat. Um, so, sorry, not to be round, roundabout, but yeah, just if you wanted to speak about those sort of two means of transmission. Hey, um, so Mike just uh, texted. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ken. So I'll respond to you in a sec. Mike just texted. Uh, so, Mike, I'm using both. Um, I can see all the questions. Oh, so Ken, who I'm talking with, Mike, is not on the app. He's I'm, I'm sort of uh, FaceTiming with him. So he's, uh, that's to uh, Mike Jarble, the, the language a little bit. He wasn't able to join the app. Um, all right. So so in case you couldn't hear, I'll just uh, repeat what Ken had just said. So basically, um, so as we mentioned, you could have some symptoms that are sort of diarrheal versus like abdominal cramping, that kind of stuff, uh, versus respiratory. Um, and so in that sense, uh, young kids in particular who might not have the best hygiene, in addition to sneezing or passing it that way, if they uh, have, uh, if they're not totally clean, then you might have different ways of spreading it, not just respiratory, um, because of these other symptoms that are going on. Um, and there are other symptoms too that are really interesting. So one of the, one of the people, uh, types of people who are most at risk are people with existing uh, high-risk cardiovascular disease. Uh, so for instance, if people are, are obese or have some obesity, uh, people who have uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and so they have high risk of cardio of, of heart or, or, uh, or having a stroke, a stroke, heart attack or stroke, um, some other people who have specific organ issues, and in addition to the um, respiratory, um, they are high risk. One thing that's been really interesting is that some people have come in with symptoms of heart attacks where they have high levels of troponin and, and other indicators that their heart is, is damaged. Uh, they, they have ECGs that, are, that show that, there, that uh, something strange is going on. Um, but, th but then when they go, they're, uh, looked at in more detail, they realize that there's no clog, there's no physical obstruction that would be typical of a heart attack. And so the virus itself seems to be doing yeah. something with the heart. Uh, all right, Mike, can you put it back on mute? I don't know how to do these. All right, so um, so so yeah. So we talked about that. So we talked about kids. Now, so like I, but but you know, this this is an issue. So in terms of the kids, if we're going to be locked down until, what maybe June first. I mean, some people are talking about for this first wave. Um, I don't know that it's truly realistic for for kids to be locked down that whole period. And if people go three weeks, a month, a month and a half without having any symptoms, then that means that even if they were asymptomatic and passed it across the whole household, they're unlikely to be sick at that point and to be able to infect anyone else at the end of that five weeks, six weeks, whatever it is. And so at that point, if you have multiple households like that and you only have one person going out to the supermarket, maybe once every couple, every couple of weeks, 
who's taking very extreme precautions, then you know, then the then the probabilities are in your favor. And so, in terms of your willingness to have uh, let your kids have play dates, maybe with one family, then that's okay. The more play dates, and again, it shouldn't be necessarily thought of as kids; it should be thought of as households. So if you have multiple kids within the same household, then your risk is roughly the same. But if you open it up to multiple households, then your risk will in increase because you don't know, is there one member of one of that one household where they're really not playing by the rules and they're going out more and, and still hanging out and with, with their other friends and maybe increasing the exposure, uh, which would increase the risk for all the households. And so, um, so that's just something for you to be thinking about. All right. Um, Ken, next question. Yeah, how does this compare with the flu? How does this compare with the flu? All right, so it's interesting. There's a, a bunch of a, a bunch of similarities and differences. So in terms of the flu, it seems to be more infectious. So typically, uh, and not not very much, uh, not not hugely more infectious, just a little bit more infectious. So I I was doing this thought experiment with some friends and family members previously. And so given what we know about the news, how rapidly it's spreading, how it's an exponential curve, if you were to think, so typically this is the way that, that it looks like in terms of the life cycle that we're thinking about so much. Typically, say someone's infected, and so on day zero, they're infected. Typically, it takes maybe five days between the infection to, uh, to, to be infected versus when they start getting symptoms. Then from symptoms, it might be another week or more until they have um, severe disease, although for some people it's more rapid. And then among those who are, at the, who are most critically ill after they've gone to the hospital and, they've, and they are the most critically ill, the ones who are in deep trouble and die, that typically happens on average around three weeks to a month after infection. So after day zero, that, that may be three weeks to a month after that is when someone dies. And so, if we're looking at the life cycle here, um, the question is, well, how many people could get infected over that, let's say four week period? Because you think that this would be like, it's like we think of zombie apocalypse. And so this person before, before the lockdown, because the lockdown has changed everything dramatically. So before the lockdown, that, period, that week or two before the lockdown, you think, okay, that person was walking around for a couple of weeks. Maybe they started having symptoms in that second week. Uh, and, and, and then we're in the hospital after, during that time, they might've gone to the supermarket, to the bars, to the office, to, to, their, uh, to the school, interacting with other people. Um, how many people could, have they, could they have infected during that time? I mean, could it have been 10 people or 20 people or 30 people? You think over that two week period, all that they were, that they were living with their families or whoever they were interacting, how many people they might've infected? And what we know, uh, and I can tell you in a second how we know, but what we know with high confidence is that over that month that it took for that person to, to, to die or, or resolve in, in, in terms of uh, recovering, so the vast, vast majority of people are going to recover, during that period, that whole month-long period, let's say, um, the total, on average, the total number of people infected from that initial person is only two to three people probably closer to around three people. And so in that sense, it seems it's kind of harder to get than a lot of people are really appreciating. So you have to be really generally in pretty close contact with people for an extended period of time in order to pass the, the virus or to risk getting the virus onto you. Obviously, you can get it from just casual contact without, uh, with, without uh, this extended period of, of, of uh, of touching or, or involvement, but it's th when you think about three people on average over that month, of, and all the activities that could have happened over that month, that's a really uh, much smaller number than you would than a lot of people would be thinking about in terms of this exponential growth. But the reason it's exponential growth is that if you start off with one person and over the course of a month you multiply that times three, and those three multiply times another three, and those three multiply times another three then the doubling rate actually is very similar to the doubling rate that we, that we see now. And that's, that's how we have high confidence that, that uh, the number of people that are infected are roughly around three or so, because that would be what you would expect given the doubling rate that we're observing. And so those things are directly related. The doubling report that, that's reported in cases 
is reveals to us what the average number uh, is uh, of these uh, new infections uh, per person needs to be. And so we have high confidence in that. Um, so how is this different from the flu? The first thing is that it's a little bit more infectious than the flu, but flu uh, tends to spread a lot about around kids. The age distribution is very different in terms of we don't know about infections, but in terms of uh, the serious consequences, in terms of both the symptoms, uh, hospitalization, and requiring critical care. Um, and so typically with this, this disease, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, older people are at much higher risk, uh, dramatically higher risk. So someone in their 80s is at tremendous risk uh, right now. Uh, so for instance, uh, let me open up my screen. <clears throat> Well, I won't, I won't say this. Well, I can open it up in terms of the specific statistics. All right, here it is. <clears throat> so according to our best knowledge right now, um, among people who are infected and are 80 years old or over, it's approximately a nine to 10% risk of dying. Um, among people who are 70 to 79, it's approximately a one in 20 risk of dying. Um, so among people who are infected. Um, among people who are infected 60 to 70, it's approximately a 2% risk. And so it drops off precipitously after that. People who are aged 50 to 59, it's a 0.6% chance of dying. Uh, people who are in their 40s, it's a 0.1% or to 0.1 to 0.2, which is roughly the same as a typical flu season. And then people in, 30s, uh, in their 30s, it's uh, less than 0.1. So it's less than typical flu season. And then from there to younger, uh, younger folks, it drops even more precipitously. So among 10-year-olds, uh, for instance, it's thought to be like 0.002%, uh, which, is, which is a um, very tiny, tiny number. In many countries, there are not even any reported infections in kids that old, despite the widespread epidemic. Uh, we're just really not seeing infections in, in kids that old. There's still a controversy um, about whether kids can be infected just because we're not seeing it. Maybe they're asymptomatic. Um, we don't know if it's just the symptoms or not. The things we need to think about, when, and so, so in terms of the flu, um, the, the one other thing we would think about in terms of the flu is that um, typically the flu um, has the seasonal component to it. And the seasonality, some people think, well, maybe seasonality is associated with the weather in terms of maybe hot and humid weather is, is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, makes it so the flu can't really thrive or, or transfer from person to person. Um, however, a, another reason for the seasonality, which is more likely, is that people get infected over the course of the winter months. And so men and, and people get vaccinated earlier in the year, say in September, October. And so that by the time you hit March, April, a lot of people have become immune to it for that strain that year, the, the, the most dominant strains that year. And so therefore, regardless of weather or anything else, people become immune. So it's harder for the flu to spread. What we do know uh, with this virus is that when you look at the Southern Hemisphere, where it's still summer there, it's spreading just about as fast there as it is in the Northern Hemisphere, where we're now entering spring. Um, and so, so the, right now there is not any evidence in the real world that we are seeing a decrease in spread. When you look at countries like Brazil, for instance, which tends to be pretty hot and humid, and right now is, is at the tail end of their summer, um, they're, uh, exponential curve looks just like the United States' exponential curve. So that means that there's, uh, there, right now there is not any strong evidence that we can expect that when the days get warmer and summer comes, that that's going to prevent uh, the spread in any uh, meaningful way. All right, so those are the main things about the flu. Ken, did you have any other ideas about the flu? I, those are the main things I'd be thinking about. No, not really. I think it was just that in the medical community we're told that you know, hot weather means that people are outside and so that a disease that primarily spreads by respiratory droplets, you'll tend to see a decrease in incidence just because people aren't in enclosed spaces. But I know with this disease, you also have people oral route of transmission. 
Um, and, you know, it's, I don't know that we have a full um, natural history, I guess, to guide, to guide ourselves with, but it is interesting that it's spreading just as quickly in the southern hemisphere, so. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. Next question. What about mutant strains? I know you and I talked about, you know, if you take a population, you quarantine them, everyone is essentially naive to the virus. None of us, you know, very few of us will have immunity because we haven't been out and about. People that have gotten it will have gotten it, but it's not spreading in the same way that it would have without a quarantine. Is there a possibility that a mutant strain arises? Is that what we may have seen with cases of quote unquote reinfection in China that people were, were reporting? And what level of alarm do you think, you know, we should have? Because ostensibly a vaccine would not treat a mutant strain. So we could be waiting a year for a vaccine that ends up treating the initial virus, but then have another virus arise in the meantime. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, these are really good questions. So uh, the que this question about mutations, the mutation rate, and how that might evolve into different strains that we don't have immunity to. All right, so first, so far what we're finding is that the mutation rate in general is roughly um, that the flu mutates around two to three times as fast as the coronavirus. So that's good news. The problem is that so many millions of people are now getting infected globally that even if you have a small mutation rate, we are seeing increasing mutations. Now, the, the, some, not all mutations are created equally. In terms of an antibody response, so there tends to be two types of immune responses. The sort of, the sort of long-term memory antibody response and then shorter-term uh, uh, immune responses. It seems like a lot of this infection is being, treat, is being uh, um, killed off by the short-term uh, immune response in people. And so that might mean that the long-term antibody response is act, might not actually be as strong for this virus as some people are hoping. Um, it does seem like there is an antibody response in some people, but, um, but it might not be 100%. And so this is problematic in a couple, for a couple of reasons. The first being that if someone gets infected and they don't have a strong antibody response, then that means they're not protected again and they can maybe get it and spread it to other people without uh, without realizing it. Uh, that's the first thing. But in terms of in terms of the mutations, basically, if you if you're thinking about an antibody response, then the antibodies are typically look are, are typically seeking and destroying the surface of the virus uh, that's circulating around. And so, what's interesting about the flu is that one of the reasons it's so successful and is able to mutate and change every year so much is that the surface actually mutates at a much faster rate than the core part of the flu virus. And so because of that, it's sort of like putting on new costumes every, like very, very frequently. Every, every season, there's lots of new costumes that it puts on. And so it can, because of the costumes and the disguises, it can bypass our immune system uh, every, uh, many seasons. So if you get the flu one year, it frequently does not prevent you from getting the flu the next year. Um, with, and so, but, the mutations in the SARS-CoV-2 don't seem to be playing that same type of game. Uh, so the mutation rate is not quite as much. That means that it's not able to change disguises very much. Some of the mutations are on random things that have nothing to do with putting on the disguises and, and putting on these new costumes. And so because of that, right now the thinking is that it's not nearly going to, even this, with the mutation rate that it is, um, we're probably not going to see as uh, these strains emerge, like we do with the flu, um, that, that are really gonna be problematic in terms of bypassing our immunity. Like I said, we still don't know what that immune response is going to look in general, but in terms of the new strains coming in and, and, uh, re and reinfecting people who've already had strong immune responses, that have strong antibody responses, um, that's not likely to be very easy to do right now. Now, having said that, there are mutations that are occurring because of these, you can sort of draw these maps globally of how this is evolving. And so if you get infected, you, and, then the, and then the genome is sequenced, you, uh, scientists can see where your strain came from. Like maybe you were living in New Jersey, and so you have like a, a strain that was common in New Jersey. And so you can see sort of the evolution of this globally. We're only sampling a small minority 
of the virus that's out there now. Um, but, but right now we're already seeing these really interesting strains. We're assuming that right now there's not much pressure. So evolution depends on, on pressure for the virus to, to, um, to focus on some mutation pathways in some way or another. Because there's no, currently there's no good treatment and, and people are just randomly getting infected, um, there's not really any pressure for it to mutate in one way or another. And so therefore we don't really expect right now that these other strains will emerge but they could emerge um, that, and to bypass our immune systems. That would be something to worry about. But not, don't worry too much if you're worried about in general. So this should not be, this, I, let me clarify, this should not be a cause for anxiety because right now this is not behaving like the flu. It is not mutating uh, in, in a, any way that suggests that there would be uh, a bypass of the immune response or the vaccines right now. All right. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think one thing also from a clinical perspective, when you mentioned that it's really our natural immunity, not, not sort of the um, acquired immunity or antibody immunity that's mediating our response to it, is maybe talking about different things that help to boost that. So certainly, you know, I kind of see the social media thing, like everyone should be getting adequate rest, they should be exercising, because these are all things that are good for your immune system, um, avoiding excess alcohol. Um, also, you know, I know there are some good studies in China and Japan on compounds like beta-glucans, which are polysaccharides present in different mushrooms like reishi, shiitake, or um, maitake. So those are kind of available at health food stores. But maybe there will be like a whole new avenue of um, research or just looking into how we can help to augment our own, um, you know, immune response. So specifically like our natural killer cells, those are kind of your first line defense rather than what you were saying, um, which is the um, white cell response that mediates um, antibodies. So yeah. anyway, it remains to be seen. Yeah, so that's a really interesting set of questions. Again, just in case you couldn't hear, Ken. So basic things that you would normally do to keep healthy, you, just because you're locked down at home doesn't mean you stop doing those basic things. So eating healthy, exercise, sleeping well, these kinds of things are really important. So if you're home and you're snacking on potato chips all day, that's probably not health inducing. Uh, if you're snacking on fruits and vegetables, then that probably does help uh, give you an additional boost uh, if God forbid you were to get infected to prevent anything bad happening. Uh, getting, that, get, making sure you sleep enough, making sure that you get your exercise. If you're locked down at home and use that as an excuse not to exercise, you're really hurting yourself. Because I mean, if we're locked down for two months, that's only a, a recipe for gaining weight. And, and, and we know that excessive gain weight, not just a little bit gain, of gain weight, but if, if, if you're already maybe overweight and, you're, and your BMI is right at the limit in terms of obesity, then this is something you really can't stop doing. You really need to be exercising, making sure that you get your exercise and uh, whatever you would typically be doing before uh, this. You wouldn't absolutely wouldn't want to push it, uh, if you're at high risk, you're, say, say you're someone listening who's in your 80s, who uh, doesn't normally exercise, you wouldn't want to exercise excessively than you normally would, and then put yourself at risk of, of, of getting into trouble because of that excessive exercise. But, but given whatever your situation is, uh, you should not use this as, as an excuse to exercise less than you normally would. All right. Oh, so talking about these antibodies, which, you know, that's a really interesting point. So in China, um, so I, um, you know, this could be an opportunity. We can we can talk about the two different types of tests that are available out there, um, and sort of and, and get into that discussion. So th there's two main types of tests. The most common one now that's that's most critical for uh, epidemic is testing the virus, uh, testing to see that there's any evidence of the RNA, and so that uses polymerase chain reactions. Um, you know, I can get into the weeds a little bit. So. Basically, the way polymerase chain reaction works is that it kind of amplifies. It looks for any weak signal of any RNA uh, pattern that might be found in a swab that's taken. It amplifies it and amplifies it and amplifies it again and tries to see if it matches uh, in terms of what, that, what the known RNA uh, pattern is for the virus. And so what that tells us, it's not exactly clear. So if you have the pattern, then, and assuming that the test is valid, then what this tells us is that the virus was present. Now, it doesn't tell us if the virus is valid. Um, 
uh, I see Mike, your text, but so in a second, I'll get to that. Um, so it doesn't tell us if the, vi if the virus is viable. Um, so that the virus might just be a remnant of the, of the, of your, of the, you might have killed the virus off and it might just be sort of an artifact that is there. So when we talk about doing this, these PCR tests, uh, the, the, the RNA uh, virus test on like doorknobs and plastic and other, and other surfaces, we don't know if that virus is actually viable when we do those tests. We're assuming that it is, so it's important to assume that it is, but we don't know for sure that it's actually viable. All we know are that the specific sequences, and, and let's be clear, so in terms of the tests that are out there, there's basically three types of virus tests that are out there. Um, the most common one that the World Health Organization is using looks at, doesn't look at the whole RNA strand. It just looks at two small segments and uses those as an indicator. Like, so it just uses those as a, as a good uh, biomarker to see that the rest of the, of the virus was there. And that seemed to be good enough. It's not, it's not completely accurate uh, because it's not testing the whole strain. It's just looking at those two little pieces of RNA uh, that make up only a tiny portion of the virus. And so because of that, um, there's gonna be false positives and false negatives that come out of that. Originally, one of the problems with this, the, the test that the CDC did originally was the CDC thought they were gonna be smart and they weren't thinking practically in terms of what they needed to do. And so instead of using two portions of the RNA, they decided to use three portions of the RNA because they thought, well, if they use three portions, then it would make that test more accurate than the test used by the World Health Organization. The problem is when they used three instead of two, it actually made it far less accurate. They started distributing it and a lot of test results were just coming back as inconclusive, where it couldn't tell if it was positive or negative just because the test was too complicated by making it look at three portions instead of two portions. So the World Health Organization uh, had a much better approach. But unfortunately, the um, Health and Human Services and the senior leadership of the U.S. government prohibited local um, pharmacies, local labs from using the World Health Organization's two-strand approach for many weeks when we could have been doing it. And so as a result, we had no eyes on the ground in terms of, in terms of looking at uh, how many people were infected. It was a real failing. For, uh, pretty much every epidemiologist I've talked to agrees uh, it is astonished, not just not just agrees that this was a failing, but is astonished at how big a failing this was by the US CDC. It's, it's historically been seen as the best in class in the world for addressing pandemics and epidemics and, and uh, both in responding to them and, and preventing them. And the fact that we had a failure of this magnitude in the US that had this kind of, of, of consequence for health and for the economy is every epidemiologist Jaw is dropping at the at the policy failures of the CDC and Health and Human Services uh, during this time. Um, they just it's, it's as if they were just uh, elementary school people doing this instead of sophisticated folks who should have known better. Um, the World Health Organization uh, had a, had something that worked. Uh, other countries, South Korea, China, China even uh, had approaches that worked, uh, and and we did not. And it's astonishing. Um, Anyway, I think I just got off topic. Ken, <laughs> what was what? So, oh, that's okay. I think actually it's interesting you mentioned China. So I heard that they actually have an antibody test. So yes, yeah, so that's really just a little bit to antibody tests and why they wouldn't be using an approach that another country that already has, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, let me get back to that. So yeah, so I was just talking and I got off topic. But yeah, so the first set of tests, these PCR tests, which look at the actual RNA itself during an epidemic before there's an immune response, the RNA test is most critical because everyone who's infected will have an RNA response, but not everyone will have an antibody response. It could take days, maybe weeks to demonstrate an antibody response. And so that means early in the epidemic and early in the, in the infection, you can't wait for a serological conversion, this antibody response that we're talking about. And so you need to look at the RNA. The problem is one of the open questions is what percentage of cases are asymptomatic. So for instance, say someone is infected, they have RNA replicating, but we, don't e we wouldn't even think to test them because they have um, no symptoms. And there's not, there, there's still to this day are not enough tests out there. Um, how do we even know? Maybe, it's, maybe there are far, far more people 
who are infected in this country and, and are asymptomatic. And there's a couple reasons that we know that that's unlikely to be the case. For, first of all, I hope it is the case. If it is the case that there are way more asymptomatic people and, and so there, the, the number of people in the United States infected is far larger than we thought, then that is great news because it would mean that the severity of the disease is actually far less than what we think right now. That that means that the, the fatality rate, the mortality rate would be far, far less than what we're thinking. So it would actually, if, if, it, if we hear at some point in the next week or two that many more people are infected than we thought, then that would actually be a good thing. So don't, that would not be a reason for anxiety. That would mean it's a good thing. The second thing in terms of thinking about these antibody tests and the, and the reason that we think it's unlikely to be the case um, that, that more people are infected than we think, there's two reasons. One, so in the outbreak in China, um, CDC, US, the US CDC um, sort of parachuted in. I mean, obviously that's figurative, they didn't actually use real parachutes, but they, they, they jumped in uh, and, uh, to, to the um, hotspot in Wuhan in China, and they started doing antibody tests there. And so with the antibody tests, they were able to start looking. So, so there's a difference between antibody tests that are um, uh, case by case, where you're looking very, like using just very sophisticated machinery uh, in a lab. Um, uh, and so I, I just saw a message from Deborah, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so there's differences between doing an antibody test in the lab versus really doing it at the population level and really getting it so it's commercially available. Because when you get it at the population level, it has to be way more robust, way more sophisticated. Like, so for instance, you could build a car that's just a prototype that works efficiently well when you do the prototype. But if you start to mass produce it, it needs to be a very different type of car that you're producing. You have to be thinking about a lot more. When we're talking about antibody tests, they're starting to be mass produced. And so they're, they are becoming more robust. But before they were mass produced, we, were, we did have the ability to do these antibody tests, sort of like using these pilots, uh, just using the, the, uh, the, the, these models. And so we, and so CDC scientists looked in China and they looked at the reported numbers of people based on the PCR, based on the RNA, and then they did samples of the population in the area looking for antibodies. And what they found was that the number of people with the antibody was only slightly more than the number of people with RNA. And so what this means is that it could mean one of two things. People with an antibody response, like I mentioned before, if everyone who got sick had an antibody response, then what this would mean under that interpretation is that there were only a smaller number of people who are asymptomatic who are not tested. That people who were tested represent the vast majority of people who had an antibody response. <clears throat> the other way of looking at this is that, well, maybe a lot of people are not getting an antibody response, in which case you might have some asymptomatic people who wouldn't have an antibody response, so it makes it harder to know. But in that case, it wouldn't, having more people infected doesn't actually tell us anything because if, if they're not generating an immune response, then even if it's more infectious than we thought, um, we shouldn't really be paying too much attention to that right now. Instead, we should be saying, paying attention to the most severe cases and what that looks like and the, and the fatality rates as our strongest evidence for the growth right now. Um, in terms of antibody tests, we do need to start doing those rapidly, assuming that there is, so, so very quickly we're gonna, when we start mass producing these antibody tests, some are already available. Um, I think that there's one, uh, Abbott uh, uh, Pharmaceuticals, I think has, is about to release one um, that has, that I think can produce an antibody test result in like something like 15 minutes or five minutes, something really, really fast. And so that'll be really helpful. Again, there's a difference between an antibody test. It could be an RNA test, but I think it's the antibody test that they've released. But again, the antibody test does not tell you if you have an active infection. The antibody test only tells you if you were previously infected. The RNA test tells you if you have an active infection. And then if you have both tests that are positive, you know you have an active infection and an immune response. If you have only the antibody test that's positive, then it means that you were previously infected and, and probably immune with a positive antibody test. Um, if you have uh, negative for both, then you're probably 
not, you might have been previously infected and didn't generate an antibody response, or you might not have been infected, in which case, either way, you're probably at risk of getting it again. Um, all right. The one, the one other thing, oh, so, so let's jump from the antibody test. Well, so, so let me go back for a second and talk, talk about two more things with antibody tests and then get into talking about vaccines from there. So the first thing is once we have a general understanding of antibodies within an area, so once this becomes commercially available, hopefully we'll get a ton of these tests done. We'll know within New Jersey, New York City, the current hotspots around the country, um, how many people have an immune response. Then we'll have a good idea of, um, of how much, how, how soon people can go back to work. <clears throat> the other thing is that um, once we have this, I, the antibody test, um, then that, so once people are, I, I guess it's the same kind of thing, once people are, are, are uh, have, an, have generated an, an immune response, then any lot future lockdown, they should be free. They could go back to work. They don't have to worry about infecting anyone. Uh, if we're talking about summer camp and kids going to summer camp, well, if the kids have an antibody positive test, then you know they can go to summer camp without any worry at all. Uh, but you know, kids, based on the on the risks that we're seeing, um, a lot of epidemiologists are still there. Again, there's it's controversy, so this is not meant to be a public policy uh, recommendation. But a lot of epidemiologists are are saying, you know, kids should probably be allowed to go to summer camp uh, after they've been on lockdown for a while. The risk is so low. Assuming that the counselors are not all are not uh, at high risk. Um, or that the kids themselves don't have some sort of comorbidities to put them at high risk, um, it's, it's probably better. In fact, if they were to go to summer camp, get exposed to the virus, and get antibodies, then at the end of the summer, then they'll be the privileged few who will then could go to school and not have to worry about getting infected and bringing it home and infecting anyone in their household. So, so there might be an interesting benefit there. That's, that's one of the things we're seeing in Germany now. Germany's um, severe cases and fatality rates are quite low, uh, even though their infection rate is, is very high and, and uh, comparable with every other European country. For, but for some reason, their fatality rate is the lowest among Europe. And the reason is that the younger folks seem to have been getting uh, sick, getting immune, uh, whereas uh, the older folks are not get, have not been getting sick because they've been, they've been staying at home more. And so as a result, um, the distribution might be very different. And, and so in terms of the evolution of this disease or how this might look over the next year or so, um, Germany might actually be in a well, very well positioned and be in a, in a very different place in terms of economic recovery, in terms of health prevention uh, or, or disease uh, morbidity prevention, this kind of stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not something to worry about. Let me jump from that though to talk about vaccines. So with the SARS virus, um, it was either SARS or MERS. Uh, I, I believe it was SARS, which are also part of the family of the coronavirus. Um, some of the early vaccine candidates that were tested, um, they, so a, a, a vaccine you typically give a, um, a, either a, a dead ver, uh, version of the virus that can't replicate or a mild strain of the virus that can replicate to try to prevent it. Typically, we don't use that was when viruses were first uh, identified. We use live virus that can replicate. We don't do that anymore just because of the risk of it mutating and spreading. And so now we typically use just portions of the, of the virus that, could, that we focus on to produce this antibody. With SARS, one of the problems with that, so typically, I think there's right now between a dozen and 20 labs working to identify candidate um, vaccines. And so when they develop candidate vaccines, they could be looking at specific parts of the RNA. So we talked before that there's patterns, that the RNA has patterns in terms of what it looks like for this virus. So let's say this was a, a, a um, oh, I don't know, an elephant. And you wanted to know if you were testing for an elephant or creating antibodies for an elephant. You wouldn't make an antibody that looked at the whole elephant because that would be too complicated. So maybe you would just look at create an antibody for something that has a very long trunk. Or someone else might make an antibody for some for an animal that has really really large ears, or someone else might make an, a, a vaccine uh, candidate that looks at an animal with um, a really long swishy tail or a really large body. And so you would look at different aspects of the virus, so the different aspects of the elephant. But you you would there's no vaccine that would do like the whole thing because that would be way too complicated uh, in terms of our current scientific ability. 
And so because of that, what we're going to have are many different candidates of vaccines, each of them focusing on a different part. And we don't know which is going to be most effective. Maybe we'll find that maybe a combination of a couple of different vaccines might be the best approach, um, but we don't know yet. One of the problems, and so now I'll, I'll bring it back to why this, why it matters for SARS. So when candidates were identified for SARS, this was maybe 10 years ago or so, give or take, um, the biggest concern with the vaccine, there's two concerns with every drug and, and vaccine that we create are both that you need to demonstrate that it works and you need to demonstrate that it's safe. Both of those are critically important. And so even if you identify a vaccine candidate, you don't know if it works until you test it, even though it might work in the, in the lab or work on, on, on test animals, you don't know until you actually test it. And you don't know um, how safe it's going to be until you actually test it in the real world. So you don't want to do many huge clinical trials all at once. If you don't know the safety of it, you typically do it in phases, in three phases, looking at safety first with a smaller number of people, then doing a second trial or set of trials with a larger number of people where you look at start looking at safety and efficacy. And then the final one is to see efficacy and efficacy is the, how, how effective it is. Um, and so with SARS, so this comes back, I keep have been circling around. Unfortunately, with SARS, some of the candidate vaccines that were found for SARS that we thought would be effective, actually, for some reason, stimulated the immune system so that when people ended up getting infected with SARS after the vaccine, they had way more serious outcomes than they would have had if they hadn't had any vaccine at all. And that's huge. We don't want to create some sort of vaccine where you give it to people and then instead of it being, uh, let's say, 1% chance at a population level that people die, that it suddenly jumps to 10% or something worse. And so above all, you need to go back to the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. So that's why when we talk about how long it takes to do these vaccine trials, we're really talking about at least a year, maybe 18 months, maybe two years to get it out, because we don't want to actually create a vaccine and give it to people and find out that we're actually increasing their risk of, of having serious illness or dying. Um, so that, that's why there's no fast way. They, when you read in the news about vaccine candidates being identified, where already some vaccine candidates have been identified. But until we actually do this epide at these epidemiological tests, so these clinical trials, where we actually have a controlled test in these three phases I talked about, the, the candidates, we don't know. You can't, there, it doesn't mean anything. Typically, when you look at drugs, it's not quite the same for vaccines, but typically for every drug candidate for a disease that we identify, only one in 20 of those drug candidates actually make it to the market because they show both safety and efficacy. They're both, they, they both do not cause any side effects that are serious or, um, and, and they demonstrate to work. Um, so th this is something we need to be thinking about. Um, and so, so in terms of what we're looking at for the vaccine, um, a, a lot of us think, so because of the, the, what we're looking at in terms of the resolution of this disease, um, Right now, less than 1% of Americans have been infected, even, even if we're looking at a million people being infected. If there's 3.5 million people in the United States, or rather 350 million people in the United States, then, um, then that means less than 1% are infected. That means that, um, that there's not very many people that are immune. So this lockdown, all it bought us is time. It hasn't stopped the virus in any in any significant way in terms of what the long term uh, spread would look like. All it did was push it out in terms of how long it's going to take for us to hopefully find some vaccines or other possible um, approaches. The two other possible approaches, while I'm on this, and then I'll get back to uh, Ken to the next question. The two other approaches where this could end earlier are so so like I mentioned earlier, because when you have a new drug candidate specific to a disease you only have a one in 20 chance of having a be successful. And so again, these candidates are not ra random drug candidates. It would be unethical to have a new um, drug that you're looking at unless the best scientists out, the, the, the scientists out there thought that it was a really, really good candidate to cure that disease or to, or to, or to treat that disease in a way that would be very compelling. If, if, you, if you 
did couldn't identify a drug candidate that was better than the standard of care in a significant way, then you wouldn't be ethically, you would not be allowed to test that drug. So that means every single drug candidate that we test for every disease, we think it is in hugely, that it's enormously compelling that that drug is, is going to be the drug that cures that disease for every drug. And yet, only one out of 20 of those drug candidates actually makes it to market. And among the ones that do, for a lot of these chronic diseases, the vast majority are not actually cures at all in terms of in practice what they, they do, but they do help the disease in some way. And so that means that, and, and these tip, and it typically takes five, 10 years to develop a new drug for a new um, uh, for, for a disease area, five to ten years. So that's way way outside of scope of what of what we're looking at here. That's why a vaccine that we could generate in maybe one to two years would be a much faster approach than a new completely new drug for this disease. So having said that, what we do have are old drugs, and so old drugs are really useful because they have already demonstrated safety. They, we know what their safety profile looks because they've already gone through the three phases of clinical trials for other diseases. And so right now there's a ton of drugs out there that are for random other diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and like the immunological diseases for malaria, for HIV, for just random other diseases out there. There's so many drugs that have been developed and we know what their safety profile is. And so what scientists have been doing is they've been taking every single drug that's out there sticking it into test tubes with this virus to see if there's any possible um, decrease in the virus based on the, in the, um, uh, the, the in, what's called in vitro. This is when you do it in a test tube uh, in glass to see uh, if, if it impacts the virus replication. And right now there's, I think, approximately 20 candidates that have been found. The World Health Organization is doing a clinical trial on like four or five of the most promising. So again, these are, are drugs, some, you might have heard of the malaria drug, you might have heard of some of these others, some of the protease inhibitors for HIV. Um, convalescent plasma is an interesting one that's being looked at, I'll get to that in a second. But so these drugs were created for other diseases. Um, right now, we don't have strong evidence that any of them are really going to work well. Um, there is some interesting evidence from a few very, very small studies that were typically uncontrolled. Some of the newer ones are, are controlled in terms of what they're released. The problem is, um, what, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, um, in terms of the problem with clinical trials, in terms of what's reported on these drugs. But so that's just overall in terms of what the timeline looks like, getting these old drugs onto market, finding one of those candidates would be probably one of the quickest things we could do. Because that, if we get a, a clinical trial going that's successful, then possibly within one month, we could have really good results, maybe two months, really good results on what this drug looks like in terms of its profile for treating this disease. And so that means that that is a very realistic scenario where we identify these candidates and can very quickly start leveraging it for this disease. The only problem is manufacturing the drug. So typically you, you only manufacture enough of the drug that's needed for the disease that you're dealing with. So if you have a drug for HIV, you typically don't do uh, don't don't manufacture a, a lot more of it than you would be planning to sell in the next six months or a year. A uh, year would be pushing it because all the drugs have a shelf life, and so you typically want to do it within a range so that you don't over manufacture because then you just have to throw out that drug. And so and so manu so the manufacturing uh, capacity is constrained because of that. If we were to vastly if we find a drug candidate that looks really compelling we could have manufacturing constraints that would limit our ability to, to ramp up how many, pardon me, how many people could get the drug. Um, so what that means is that, two, well, it means a couple of things. One, if we find that this is successful for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, that we find that, a, let's say, an HIV drug is successful for SARS-CoV-2, then the risk is that the SARS-CoV-2 patients would be competing with the HIV patients for the same drug with the limited supply, especially for the first month or two. Um, and so that's, that would be very problematic. The second thing is because of the limited supply, we'd probably want to only treat the people who were either at highest risk 
and they became symptomatic or people with the most severe disease, regardless of what their previously, previous risk was. Um, and so we would focus on that. Once the manufacturing capacity increased, and I don't know what the ramp up curve for that would look like, but there, there should be ways to do it faster. If, if this government had a will to do it faster, there would be no reason why there might be some generics out there, for instance, where we could take over the manufacturing capacity of those plants and just have them just churn out whatever drug we find to, be, to, to work well. But once that becomes more readily available, then we might be able to take these drugs prophylactically. And so that would be something else to, to um, evaluate too, because that, that you'd have to worry about once you uh, give this to many, many more, potentially millions of people um, prophylactically, particularly the high risk folks, um, you have to, we'd have to reevaluate the safety profile because the safety, uh, let's say a 10% risk of something for a high risk disease be an acceptable safety profile, but if you had a 10% risk among 350 million people, um, then you're talking about 35 million people having the safety issue, and, and that would not be something that you wanted. So we'd still have to reevaluate prophylactically what this would look like. We do have recent experience with this. So HIV is a really good example that a lot of people have been using. Um, so HIV has been around for a few decades now. Um, we know that uh, some drugs we have been on the market for a while, uh, and so we understand their safety profile, we understand how effective they are. And so over the last bunch of years, um, companies have created a, the, a smaller dose of the same drug and give it out prophylactically. And, they've, and some of these drugs have been shown to be 99% effective at preventing the spread of HIV among people who just take it prophylactically. And so that is really compelling for HIV, for high-risk uh, individuals to take this if they don't have HIV to prevent them getting HIV. Um, and so the idea is that, well, maybe if we identify a good drug candidate that turns out to have therapeutic value for, for SARS-CoV-2, maybe we could start doing this uh, prophylactically, particularly for those of us at highest risk. And so, you know, if a, an 80-year-old, all they had to do was pop a pill once a day and the risk was low, but that means they could go back to living their lives normally and going outside and going traveling, then you know, maybe that could be compelling. So that's the second thing. So in terms of what we've talked about so far, we've talked about vaccines. What the heck is the third thing that's, that we've talked about? The first is vaccines as a, as a compelling, uh, most likely thing to end it for everyone in terms of looking at one year to two years out. Um, the next thing is looking at uh, new candidate drugs, which would probably be more like a five to 10 year uh, lookout. Uh, the third thing is looking at pre-existing drugs as a, as a possibility. Another, so there's two other kinds of, of approaches that, that are interesting that people are looking at. One of them is called convalescent plasma. And so among people who have been infected have created a strong antibody response. Again, some people don't create a strong antibody response, but among those with the strongest antibody response, um, their plasma has lots of antibodies circulating around. And we've known for many, many decades that if you take that plasma among the recently recovered people who have no more virus in their body, if you take that and then inject it into a sick person, then those antibodies go to war in that sick person against the virus there. And it's a really, really effective treatment. And so it was, it's been, looked, it's been uh, evaluated for this virus in, uh, in China already. It's among the clinical trials that are going on now. Um, and so that could be a, a really interesting um, approach. There's another form of this called HID, uh, rather HIG. I believe that refers to hyperimmune immunoglobulin or something. That's where you just sort of, uh, uh, sort of concentrate the plasma just specifically to the immunoglobulin. And that's sort of one step more sophisticated than just taking the plasma from a donation. Um, and that's being investigated as well because that theoretically would only require a small injection, whereas um, this plasma, like the sort of the plasma when we're talking about convalescent plasma from a recovered person's blood, um, you sort of take out the red blood cells and just sort of like have the plasma and, and the other stuff in there. Um, that would require more of an infusion type of thing, just because there's so much more liquid that you have uh, to, to, to give to the person. Yeah, and just like that, you, you do have risk for something called Arthus reaction or serum sickness. So because you're not isolating just the immunoglobulin, which is just an 
another way here of saying antibody. So you don't just have the antibodies to the virus, you have all the other antibodies. So they might have antibodies to your red blood cells or just different things in your body so you can get like a short-lived uh, feeling of intense illness after getting that. So I think that's why people historically haven't used that, even though there is some effectiveness of it. But. Right, so that's, that's the, again, so in case you didn't hear very clearly, there's certainly risk. Uh, the plasma has a lot of other stuff in it than just simply the antibodies uh, and, and just sim simply the antibody for SARS-CoV-2. You have every antibody that your body has circulating normally is already in that plasma still. And so that means that say you have an autoimmune disease and you have extra antibodies in there, then guess what? You give that plasma to someone and then that could be triggering all sorts of bad things in, that, in, in the patient. So, you, so right now it's being investigated. Um, so it, it is being investigated clinically because if someone's at risk of dying, then you're willing to give them a higher risk treatment. Um, but, it, but again, it's still something that is unclear how widely rolled out that would be. So this is, what is this, the fourth uh, option? The fifth option are uh, some people are investigating MAG. Um, and so these are um, uh, uh, antibodies that we're talking about where there are some drugs out there in a bunch of therapeutic areas, some of them that I'm working on currently. Um, where you create these um, these antibodies that are artificial that are that are antibodies they're very specific it's not a vaccine it's an antibody that's used for treatment and this has to be evaluated like another drug so typically it could take years to produce but there are there's some thinking that we might be able to fast track some of these antibodies depending on what we're looking at and it's because it's very specific to this disease and so that's a, another option in terms of a, um, an approach to dealing with this. Um, that's an antibody doing, looking at the MAB would probably take, um, it, it's not something that we'd be looking at months. This would again be something that we're looking at over years uh, to do. But, but again, if, so most likely we're looking at a combination. So these are, this is kind of the universe of our options out there uh, in terms of treatment. And so, so most likely we're looking at, at um, months to years. It's likely to be a combination if we find a, a drug that is a good uh, that works therapeutically pretty well for an existing um, uh, therapy class that's out there. Then maybe we could start using that prophylactically for a year or two until vaccines become available, and then just sort of have like have coverage in terms of prevention during that window. Um, and then after the vaccines, hopefully, if we start having more uh, better drugs out there, then that would be great. Um, I don't know what question started this, but. <laughs> I've talked for a while. Maybe we should switch to another question again, or unless you have anything to, to add. Uh, no, that was it. Um, I think if you could maybe just kind of paint a broader picture about how this will evolve over the next few weeks, months, and then years. Um, I know you talked about, you know, at this point, we really would only have 1% of people infected, leaving 99% of people essentially, you know, immunonaive to this. Um, so what do you see happening? And maybe if you want to all right, Deborah. I, I see Deborah saying me, please. So after I after I talk about this, then we'll talk about that in a second. Well, there's a bunch of questions there, so I'll just talk about firstly in terms about how this is going to resolve over the next few weeks to months. Um, so basically, right now in our arsenal, our existing arsenal of dealing with this epidemic, there are only two things we can do. Uh, essentially, only one thing we can do, and that one thing is social isolation of anyone who's infected. Um, typically. There's two ways of identifying these people. One way, and this is the way, this is epidemiology 101, is you test people who you think might be at risk or at high risk of having the disease. And then you, people who have a positive test result, you trace all the people that person could have come into contact with or the people that, uh, so, so you wanna trace both things, who, who may have infected them and who they may have infected. And so, what, and so this approach called test and trace is epidemiology 101. Literally, this is, we've known this for hundreds of years uh, in terms of, uh, even from John Snow, uh, when he first identified uh, looking at surveillance. Um, and John Snow, is, it corresponds with the um, Game of Thrones character. But actually, in the history of epidemiology, hundreds of years ago, um, he was one of the pivotal figures. He was the first person to identify um, that by, simply by using diagnostic tests and surveillance um, and, and identifying patients, he, he put all of the, all of the infected people, um, I think it was cholera he was looking at, 
um, but correct, but I might be wrong about that. My, I, I haven't uh, taught this stuff in a few years now. Um, so he put them all on a map. And then based on that, he was able to see where people were getting infected based on the map. He realized that everyone who was infected based on that outbreak had been using the same well and the same uh, water pump at that well to, to use water. And interestingly, people who were going to the bars weren't drinking a lot of water, but were drinking a lot of beer. They were protected from cholera. Like, so it was really interesting that the beer drinkers actually were the ones who were not infected with that during that outbreak. So sometimes there's protection and you would not even think just from really random things are protecting you. But anyway, John Snow, he was the seminal figure. Uh, it's taught in all epidemiology 101 classes. Surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. That's the most important thing. Um, and so basically, once you can identify people with, tar with um, testing and tracing, then you can just pull those individu individuals out and quarantine only them. And by quarantine, we're not talking about social isolation, the lockdown that we're doing now. Right now, people can still take a break from lockdown if they want and go out food shopping and go to the park and, and other things, which is still okay generally during this lockdown at the population level. Um, but for a real quarantine for these people, they literally have to be in their homes. China in their quarantine forced people to be it locked in their house with a military response. Like they literally had drones going around the streets of China. Um, and, so they, and so people were truly in quarantine for two months. Um, and so that's a very different type of thing than the uh, lockdown we have here where people can just decide to go and food shopping whenever they want. Um, but so in terms of uh, uh, testing and tracing, that is working extremely effectively in, in many countries. So, um, so South Korea was one of the first to really show that uh, its effectiveness because it was very early in the curve. It has close geographic proximity to China. And so they were able to uh, very quickly uh, or they be, because they were so close and they had previous uh, um, epidemics, they were prepared. Um, so so um, they had a, a, a playbook that uh, sort of like, if, if in case of emergency, break this glass. They broke the glass, they had the playbook, they followed the rules, and they um, had test and trace. They, they, they immediately implemented test and trace. They started having a bunch of people coming in because of uh, people have been traveling to China, there were some local infections, but they, so they did get a lot of cases, they had some fatalities, but they were able to get it under control very rapidly. And so they're still, their economy was not hard, as hard hit as ours. Um, they have, will probably have periods of lockdown versus not lockdown like we have, um, but they're in much, much better shape because of their, their tracing. Unfortunately, so the US, the RCDC was the best in the world. And so we also had a, a, a sort of, in case of emergency, break glass playbook. And the playbook was never activated. And so we had it in place and it was never activated. And so even to this day, we're still not doing a lot of the basic things that are in this playbook that we had, that the, the folks in, in Health and Human Services and FDA and CDC had bet, put best place practices in. And a lot of those folks who created the playbook are no longer at the, in, in, uh, in the government. And so it's, it's problematic. But because we had not, we, in the US, we did not have enough tests available, we couldn't do test and trace. And so it was, with test and trace, I kind of think of it as whack-a-mole. Like, you know that, uh, that old arcade game where you have these, these little plastic moles that pop up and you whack it down? With test and trace, you're, play, you're essentially playing a game of whack-a-mole. And if you're good at it, you can have a really effective approach to preventing an uh, uh, epidemic. But because we didn't have the test, we were essentially playing whack-a-mole blindfolded. And so it, it got, un so it was out of control. And so when it becomes out of control, the only approach is lockdown. There's no other approach. But lockdown we know is effective. It doesn't eliminate the virus because people are still, you know, we, we're still ordering things from Amazon. So there are thousands, many thousands of people at these Amazon warehouses all over the country. There's people at Kmart warehouses and all these other, Walmart, all, all these other stores. There's the postal service is still running. So there's lots of infections still going on. Um, it's not as high as it was. So it's thought to be extremely effective. But what it means is that when we come out of lockdown, whenever we do in two months and three months, there's still going to be circulating virus. Because of the lack of tests, we're still not gonna know where they are. But the hope is, and the reason that, the, that we're, what we're planning on is that we'll have enough diagnostic tests at that point 
whenever we come out of lockdown, that we'll be able to play whack-a-mole at that point with, with I guess, without being blindfolded. We'll, we'll be able to see these new cases as they arise. Right now, so I guess over the last few weeks in, in states, so, so right now in the outbreaks where we do have a lockdown, like we're talking about um, California, New Jersey, New York, et cetera, um, in these places, it went out of control. In some other states, it's still not out of control. And so test and trace can still work. Previously, some states were looking at people the day that they became symptomatic as the day in which you would look at test and trace. So you would look at anyone who they came into contact after they became asymptomatic and maybe the folks who they who might have contacted them that day that they were asymptomatic. Now the best practice that states are adapting is they're looking two days before the first symptoms. So if symptom, someone's identified with symptoms someone, that, that person then goes and gets a positive test result, then we look back and we say, okay, um, it's probably two days, maybe three days. Two, the, the problem is that if you go back three days versus two days, you might dramatically expand the number of people you have to test and trace, and two days is probably sufficient, because that third day before symptoms, they're probably really, really at very, very low likelihood of, of, um, spread, of spreading it to anyone during that time. Um, and so I lost my train of thought. Where, what was the original question? Oh, how does this evolve? So, so yeah, the goal is that we're trying to figure out um, if we have enough uh, of these tests available, then we're going to prioritize testing and tracing so that all of the people who might have come into contact with any positive test will test and trace them. At that point, this will look like South Korea if, we're, if we do it effectively. And if we can do that, then the curve will essentially be flat. And we could hopefully prevent ourselves from having to go under lockdown again. If in that scenario, this could be the only wait. There might be some hot spots that develop um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and so that means that there might be a second or a third wave, in which case we would have to do another lockdown like we're doing now. In terms of the economic consequences of that, there, there's, two, there's basically two signals I'm thinking about. So I'm currently not in a role as an economist. Previously, I worked at, uh, at Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, where my role was health economics, even though I was doing epidemiology analytics. I was in the economics and business analytics side of things, so I also have a point of view on how this evolved. Um, but, but so but there's a couple of things that people are probably going to be looking at in terms of the economics of this. One is the death rate is going to be really scary. Oh, Mike is. Uh, let's. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about economics, Mike, and then, but then I'll come back to the epidemiology stuff. Um, to just because there's so much to talk about, but fine if not, fine. Okay, so so basically, what I'm looking at just epidemiologically are fear. So once people start seeing the death rate climbing and climbing, so we're not talking about hundreds of people dying a day, but we're starting to talk about thousands or more people dying per day. People, there's the, whatever the fear is now, the fear is going to be more then. Um, and and it's and during previous pandemics. One thing that's pretty universal is that people think the world is going to end. In all cases, we know the world is not going to end. We've had lots of pandemics in the past. We've, we're going to have lots of pandemics in the future. This is just what it means to be a living, a living animal in the world. And so the last one, the last huge one that we had that was a mass outbreak that required quarantine was the um, influenza of 1918 that was called the Spanish flu back then. Um, and it's, so it's been roughly 100 years since then. They don't happen very often. In terms of outbreaks, they do happen much more frequently. I mean, even over the last, what, 10, 15 years, there have been a, many of them. We had an Ebola outbreak and SARS and MERS and Zika and all these uh, novel viruses and, uh, and new infections that have spread. And um, because of these effective playbooks, looking at test and trace and, and other uh, epidemiology 101 approaches, we never had the lockdown that we needed here. Um, so this is, it was because of a policy failure is what the way I see it, that this was, this uh, is what we're forcing, forcing ourselves onto now. Um, so in terms of how this evolves, the one thing is the death. Once that starts to peak, that'll give people comfort. The problem is that if what the peak doesn't mean it just drops off a cliff from there. The peak just means that's the peak. Probably three weeks after the peak is when you'll start seeing a really dramatic so you start seeing a decrease after that, but probably won't be for another three weeks until you start seeing um, a, a, a really uh, 
big deep uh, uh, cut into the number of new cases. There's also a, a delay. Let me just say briefly, if you're looking at the number of diagnosed cases and when that peaks versus the uh, number of people in hospital beds versus number of people dying, there's typically a delay so that once someone is, gets a, becomes a case, uh, there's typically two to three weeks before the fatality before they die. So what that means is that we're probably looking at first looking at a peak in the new cases, and then looking at a peak two to three weeks later in terms of people dying. And so that's so we'll, we'll see this. This will give us comfort when we start going on the under, other side of the curve. It starts going down. We don't want to open up the doors and open up the lockdown too quickly because, like I said, there is circulating virus. The more out that's out there, the higher our risk of being infected. And so, um, and so, probably at least three weeks after the peak, maybe more until we uh, until we want to open up the lockdown. Like I said, in terms of the the resolution of this, um, we've talked about the treatment possibilities and what that will look like over the next year or two. Um, we're, this is probably something that's going to continue to be in the news for one to two years um, until we have a vaccine and can really just punctuate it that way. Um, but yeah, and, and so there's, it's very likely we, we will be playing whack-a-mole. You know, we're not 100% effective at playing whack-a-mole, even if we had really, really good tests out there, because you essentially need an army of people who are making phone calls and tracking down the traces, tra trying to track down who people might have infected. <clears throat> and you can't just, I, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people unemployed, and I wish we could just bring all those people on to be our army that goes door to door just trying to find these people who might have come into contact with people who are positive. The problem is it's a health issue and there's privacy issues. And so we can't just have anyone knocking on people's doors to, to their friends and family to, to say they might have been infected. So we were, it's probably the constraint is gonna be a capacity issue there in terms of our public health system's ability to trace people now that it's so common out there. So that means that there's probably a strong likelihood that there will be another um, a peak at some point, or not not peak, another outbreak at some point uh, that will force us to lock down in parts of the country. And that's the other thing. So this country is bad. Um, there are about as many people order of magnitude in the US as there is across all of Europe. So if you had up Germany and France and UK and, and Sweden and Estonia, call out Estonia, and, um, and all across, the Europe, uh, across Europe, that number is roughly the same as our one country in the United States. And so because of that, we kind of are almost like many countries that we're looking at at one. And so you might have a lockdown in New York or New York City, but then not have a lockdown in Kansas. And so that means that the, out, that the, the outbreak in Kansas is still ongoing in an exponential fashion, whereas we're on lockdown in New York. That means that when we do open, because we don't have as many infections circulating in New York, well, guess what? If someone in Kansas is now near the peak of their infection, what are we gonna do in New York? Are we gonna then open up, even though we don't have a lot of, of uh, new cases in New York, with the risk that people in Kansas could just come to the city for, for a weekend, and then suddenly you have new cases that are hard to, tra to trace? Or what are we gonna do? I, I don't know yet. That's, it's, a, it's an interesting problem that's going to be a challenge to, over the next few months um, when we're talking about undoing this lockdown. And so we're gonna have to look closely at how other states are addressing the lockdown. One of the other problems is um, the, um, how, how, how well cases are diagnosed, pardon me. So in terms of the number of patients that are known to be cases, um, that's an open question. Some states that have the least number of cases might also be doing the worst job at diagnosing. That's probably associated. And so that means that they won't really know how many they have until they start seeing more deaths and more respiratory distress. All right, so that's how it'll probably evolve over the next two or three weeks and two or three months. Um, before I get to Deborah's questions, <laughs> uh, before I get there, um, I just wanna talk about one other thing that's related to, to what we've just discussed. And that is in terms of cases that are out there, some people said, well, how do we know that this is new versus, um, versus maybe how do we know if it wasn't circulating for a couple of months? I mentioned in China that we did these antibody tests, so we have a pretty good idea 
generally order of magnitude, how many are asymptomatic representative as a proportion of total infected, given those constraints. But um, what we, so what we would have expected, a, a lot of people thought that they were infected with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 when they first heard it. They had the, the dry cough, they had the sore throat back in December, back in January in the United States. And a lot of people had these symptoms fever, et cetera. The problem is that that was right in the middle of flu and cold season. And so the vast majority of people with those symptoms had the flu or the cold. And we know this for a couple of reasons. The first reason <clears throat> is that um, among when you had, when people were ultimately given the tests that we had available in March, at first, it was very unlikely, even with people with the symptoms, with a, with a cough, with maybe a fever, maybe not a fever, but with the sore throat, only like 10% or 20% of people with those symptoms actually turned out to be a positive case with SARS-CoV-2, which means that the vast majority of people early in March um, who had those symptoms did not have this virus. They actually just had cold or flu, like a regular cold or flu season. And so that means that the earlier you went, the most, the more likely it was that that would that that was just cold or flu. As we are now leaving cold and flu season, I mean, unfortunately, now we're ending uh, entering seasonal allergy uh, season. <laughs> so, um, and that I have seasonal allergies a little bit, and so that if you hear me, uh, then that might be what uh, what you're hearing. But, um, but so that that would make people have symptoms and then have a, a negative test result because they're they're misdiagnosed. But so now over the last week or two. Um, among people who have a SARS-CoV-2 test with the um, symptoms, I think now, and depending on where they are, it's a much higher rate of being actually having SARS-CoV-2. So I think in some places, maybe like 25% positive or 50% positive. It's still the case that a lot of people with symptoms don't have SARS-CoV-2. And so that's just something really, really important to know. Um, another, okay, so I, I um, I'll, I'll get to Deborah's and then we can then we can talk more about diagnostic tests in a bit. All right, Deborah, I'm going to look to see what you wrote. All right. Are people who get uh, COVID-19 able to get it again? And so again, we don't know yet. Um, it depends on this antibody response. If people had a strong antibody response, then the assumption is no. There's very, very high confidence that people would not be able to get reinfected. Yet, here is what we are seeing. So some people who test negative with this PCR test, a day, a few days or a few weeks might go by, a couple weeks is the, I think the longest that we've seen so far, and they do test positive again. And there's an open question, were they um, reinfected or were they, did they have a continuing infection and they just tested negative despite the fact that they were still infected? And there's a couple ways of looking at this. One way of looking at it is um, that a negative test is just an indicator. It's not, it doesn't tell us the, exactly what we want to know. It's just an indicator. Like, so if someone has a mammogram for breast cancer, it doesn't tell us for sure if there's breast cancer or not. It's just a test. Then you would need to follow it up with a biopsy or a better test to really see if it's true or not. Ultimately, with these tests, you want them to be as sensitive as possible. And what that means is that you want to err on the side of having false positives so that you really capture everyone who really is a positive. And if you happen to capture some people who are not really positive, but just erring on the side of capturing them, you want that to happen so that you don't miss anyone. Because when you do a sensitivity test for screening, uh, rather, when you do a screening test, you want it to be as highly sensitive as possible because if you have a false negative, then that means that someone could truly have SARS-CoV-2 and you don't catch it because it, it, you, it, the, the, the test result comes out as negative and, it tell, and so they believe that they don't really have it. You don't want that to happen. Right now, I don't know exactly what the false negative rate is with our tests. Um, I think that most of the tests in the, that the World Health Organization is using are above 95%, maybe above 99% uh, sensitive, which is, which is really good. Um, but what that means at a population level, um, so say you were to give this test to 100 million people, 
and say in five percent of the people um it was you they they said uh, it was false negatives so five percent of the people no let's go the other way let's say five percent let's say it was false positive in five percent of the people then that means that if you have let's say a hundred million people that you test if it's five percent or false positives then you know regardless of how many people actually are positive actually have SARS-CoV-2 you know simply because the test isn't perfect that if you test 100 million people and 5% are false positive that you're going to have 5 million people who are told that they're positive when they're not really positive positive. and that's problematic um, and so even if there's only one person who's positive at the end of the lockdown and you test all these people having 5 million people told that they're positive is not going to play well and so that means that we need to be very uh, more strategic in terms of how we do, how we deploy these tests. And so we'll have this more sensitive test first, the screening. We'll probably end up following that up with an antibody test. And so doing two different tests will help to very quickly knock down that number, the 5 million wrong, to really just target on the people who are more likely to, to be true cases. Um, and so that's going back to the question, are people able to get it again? Right now, we're assuming if people have strong antibody tests, they will not be able to get it again. Uh, so our, to the best of our knowledge, whether that lasts weeks, months, or years, right now, to the best of our knowledge, we're thinking years. Maybe not decades, but years. And that would probably be sufficient for us for during the current uh, epidemic. Um, the other question you had, if someone thinks they had it but stayed home and now has no sense of taste or smell, could that confirm that they likely did? All right. So I don't, I wouldn't say that it confirms it, but it would be an indicator that they might have. And so I would use that as a reason to self quarantine um, to over the next two to three weeks, uh, probably three weeks to be safe, um, to ensure that if someone lost their sense of smell, again, that it is, that is a, another uh, symptom or sign of, of having, of being infected with this disease. Some people simply lose their sense of taste or smell with no other symptom. And that would be a reason to quarantine. And by quarantine, what I mean by that is not going food shopping, not going out of the house, but truly not exposing yourself to anyone else. And so even within the house, if you have a household with other people, you really have to isolate yourself from other people in the house unless they've been exposed as well. Um, so it's, it's really talking about quarantine rather than social isolation at that point. Um, all right. Any, okay, so Ken, let's go back to you. What other questions are there? Um, this one says, should people rescind DNR if they have one? So DNR is a do not resuscitate order. Um, I don't know why um, why people would resuscitate, re rescind that. Um, I, I mean, if someone chooses to not resuscitate, um, because for whatever reason they have, um, I don't know why they would say they want to be resuscitated because of this um, virus. This is more like a, this is an intensely personal question about yeah. what what kind of medical measures you want to can for you or not. So um, the things I would be thinking about. So one, so there are some things that we know in terms of the clinical progression of this disease. So the problem is, so there are basically three ways that people die from, the, from COVID-19. The first way is respiratory distress, severe respiratory distress. Essentially this virus, so the way the viruses work is they go into cells, they hijack the cell's machinery to replicate themselves, and then they burst the cells and escape so that the viruses can then infect other cells nearby. The problem is if you have too many cells that start rupturing, then you cause scarring. And this scarring is called fibrosis. And so pulmonary fibrosis is a well-known disease, um, but, but so people who have too much scarring are at highly increased risk of dying. And if they, and the problem is, even if they survive, people with pulmonary fibrosis have this problem for the rest of their lives. Having, having scarring of the lungs makes it extremely difficult to breathe. So for the rest of their lives, they will have this, this uh, comorbidity. Um, there are drugs that are currently being evaluated for pulmonary fibrosis, for scarring of the lungs, because that's a disease that's been out there for a while for other reasons. 
Um, so there are definitely drugs out there. Who knows? Maybe in five years, maybe 10 years, there will be some really good drugs. I don't need, there Maybe there are some on the market. I, I don't know what currently exists in this area right now. But there, I know that there are certainly some that are under investigation um, that are really good candidates for treating it. But, then, uh, but that we're looking five years or more uh, before they might become uh, available on the market. That's the first way people die from this. The, the first way is the, um, the, sep the, the fibrosis of the lungs. The second way is sepsis. And sepsis is when you have uh, an extreme reaction uh, in your body. So in case people don't know, the virus is not actually causing your symptoms. Some people have the identical virus and are asymptomatic. So someone could be asymptomatic, potentially give the same identical virus to someone else, they'll get infected and have severe symptoms. The reason is that people's immune response varies across people. The flu-like symptoms is something that has to do with the person responding to the virus and not the virus itself. So the virus can have very, very different impacts across people. And so some people's immune response is so excessive and so exaggerated that that's what causes this problem. And so that could be responsible for some of the scarring in the lungs, but also more importantly, it could cause the sepsis. And once you get the sepsis, you get your, the, the um, chemicals in your bloodstream that are just trying to attack the virus and, and the, essentially what are causing the flu-like symptoms. Typically it's the cytokines, but it's other things too that are causing the symptoms. And you have what's called a cytokine storm. And it just goes around and it just is out of control. Like imagine like hurricanes going through your body and just destroy, like from organ to organ. And so some people have other organ damage from, from these cytokine storms in terms of uh, you could have kidney problems or other types of problems just because the immune response has gone crazy. And so that's what we're seeing too. There are also other drugs in the market uh, being evaluated for treating sepsis, but still, I don't know what's available for that. It's a whole different set of, of issues. That's really among the most critically uh, severe patients. The third way that people are dying from this is from pre-existing conditions where like if someone is at high risk of a heart attack and they have a heart attack because maybe it wasn't the flu itself that destroyed the heart, but instead it just pushed the heart attack over the edge and they were just a little bit more likely to have that heart attack than they would have been, then those people might be at increased risk and that might be another reason that uh, people might be dying. That's, that's what gives us this um, roughly 1% death rate that we're looking at. Those, that's, those are the people that are contributing to that. In other parts of the, of the world, in Wuhan, China, in parts of Italy, where they've exceeded the capacity uh, to, to, to bring people in for basic treatment, then, then you're seeing more people die from other things, um, even, even from things that could be treatable. If someone has a life-threatening heart attack where they did not have the virus at all, but people, this, the virus doesn't, doesn't mean that people who would have had heart attacks this year are not going to have them. People are still just regularly going to have heart attacks, just as we know at the population level they do every year. Um, this doesn't prevent those people from having heart attacks. But if our hospitals fill up and there aren't enough beds, then people with a mild heart attack can't get treatment. And so what was previously life-threatening, but those people would, like, would be likely to survive, now if there's not a bed available for them, then they would be sent home. And that would be the risk that, that then you see the fatality rates at the population level really starting to rise at a quite a bit higher level. Um, and so luckily we're not there yet. That's the whole reason we're under lockdown is not to stop the virus period, like as if it was a quarantine. The whole point of the lockdown is to prevent our hospitals from breaching capacity. Because if we breach capacity, then you're not talking about 1% or less fatality rate then you're starting to talk about three or four or more percent fatal fatality rate, uh, excess fatality rate than what you would have expected in a given year for people dying. All right, I don't know if I answered that question or not. I think I did. All right, next. <laughs> Do we know? I'm just looking at some of these other, Do you have other questions there? Dan, I'm looking down at this list here. Yeah. Only other one we didn't answer was SARS-CoV-2 created in a lab. How do we know that it's not? Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, so it's so there's two conspiracy theories that are out there. It's not just one, but there's actually two competing with each other apparently. One conspiracy theory comes from the U.S. 
And this conspiracy theory is saying, well, you know, we have this trade war with China. China doesn't like the U.S. very much. Maybe China created this virus. They were willing to sacrifice their own people uh, and, and then spread it to the world, knowing that it would have a much bigger impact in the United States and maybe throw the election against Trump. Because, uh, but, and this would be a, ch- a way of, for China to sort of uh, discreetly create this warfare against the U.S by, by uh, creating in a lab uh, this virus. And so there were some labs, in fact, there were some labs in Wuhan in China that were working specifically on, uh, on studying SARS and other related viruses. The other, the other conspiracy theory is the opposite conspiracy theory. And this is one being spread in China and parts of Asia. Um, no, Deborah, I did not start that anti-Trump theory. That was, that's, that's uh, uh, some of the radical right people in the United States have this theory that it was uh, that it was something started by China and and is going around the, uh, and that, and that's the reason. The other and that's that's in fact um, one of the reasons calling it the China virus was this idea that China was responsible insidiously for for releasing this virus on the world on purpose um, and which is which is not true. The second conspiracy theory is actually being spread by China and Asian countries, which is just as bad. And they're blaming it on the U.S., saying, actually, the U.S. had more sophisticated labs. We created this virus in the U.S. and then released it into China as an attack on China. And that's also not true. Um, And we know that this is not true for a really good reason. And that is, if this were true and it was done in the lab, I guess there's two reasons. One, if it were true and it were created in a lab, it would be much cleaner. So if you were to hypothetically think of a virus that would cause this type of damage, you'd probably put together like Legos, building blocks together to build up a virus in the lab based on the the building blocks that you had. And what we see in in SARS-CoV-2 is that it's a very messy virus. It's not something that's a small, like the flu virus itself is way smaller than this virus. This virus is very messy. It clearly uh, wasn't something that was put together with a few building blocks. Instead, it's clearly something that was generated from evolution, what you'd expect from evolution, because it was extremely messy and clunky and it's not efficient. <clears throat> the other reason that we know this is because if you wanted to create, if, you're, if your purpose were to be devious and to create a viral epidemic for some reason, you would want to start with a human virus like take the flu or something and then change that a little bit to make it more uh, more fatal. What we know is that this virus actually is not a human virus. We know that it's actually a bat virus or from another animal species, and it's just been gro- growing for millennia in those other animals. And so to create a mutant strain from that animal to infect a human and then make it an additional mutation so it affects so it can infect from person to person is extremely complicated and we frankly don't even know how to do it that well even if we wanted to because it's a it's a animal virus and so its behaviors would be unpredictable in humans and so even if we wanted to not so so that means two things not only would it be inefficient in terms of the building block approach but it would also be we don't our medical science isn't sophisticated enough to even do that from using an animal virus as the base. We'd want to start with a human virus as the base. So this gives us really, really high confidence that this was not created in either an American lab or a Chinese lab. So hopefully that punctuates that a little bit. Um, Other questions? We talked about... Okay. Last one. Why aren't we as a country still not testing everyone presumed positive? All right, so that is a really important question. For now, it really doesn't matter. Let's see. So for for now, it really doesn't matter because if we are under lockdown, if you have presumed positive, if you're if you're if you are likely to have SARS-CoV-2, then it doesn't make a difference whether you test positive or don't test positive. You should be quarantining and just staying in place either way. So because of that, we don't really need to test you. Just just assume that you have it, quarantine in place for the next however long period of time we're all going to be locked down, and don't worry about it. 
once the lockdown is over, it would be a good idea to get an antibody test. And then you could confirm if you had it or not, and that would be good. But, but right now, given the scenario that we're in with the lockdown, it really doesn't matter right now, right? I mean, if you have severe symptoms, you go to the hospital. If you don't have severe ho symptoms, don't go to the hospital, and then you're good. If you do have severe symptoms, here's another interesting thing. We're, we're, a bit, we're leaving the flu and cold season. So we were in the flu and cold season earlier. It's really tailing down. Um, we did see comorbidities. So having SAR, uh, an infection of SARS-CoV-2 does not prevent you from actually getting the flu also. That's really bad. And you could, act, you could actually be co-infected with both viruses at the same time. And the worry, if someone did have the flu and did have severe symptoms of the flu, that would seem like uh, SARS-CoV-2, the worry would be that someone with flu symptoms would go to the hospital and they didn't have SARS-CoV-2, they only had the flu, which was bad enough, would, and maybe would be a reason to go to the hospital, but they might go to the hospital and get infected at the hospital in the waiting room or wherever with SARS-CoV-2 from other people. Then they're even in worse shape than they would have been if they hadn't gone to the hospital at all. So it's better for people just to stay home unless they truly have serious, serious disease in terms of like real trouble breathing, heart uh, problems, stuff like that. Um, but otherwise, if you think you might have it, you know, assume you do have it and just stay home. Once we have locked, once lockdown is over, then pest and trace will become more critical again. And so then we will truly need to identify every single person who is um, a positive. Right now, so we are, lim we are still testing some people. The people we're testing are high risk cases, people in the hospital, for instance, who are um, SARS-CoV-2 for two reasons. One, we know what the, pro what the progression is starting to look like among those patients. And so we need to isolate them more. And two, in terms of that isolation, um, if someone has the flu or, or other cold symptoms that might be severe, but not SARS-CoV-2, we wouldn't need to isolate them in the same way. And so we wouldn't have to worry about them in terms of quite as much severity. Whereas if someone is a positive case for SARS-CoV-2, the measures that we have to put in place so that the health personnel don't get infected or that they don't infect other patients are really, really severe. So within a hospital context, we do need to separate these patients out. So we do need to ensure we have these diagnostic tests available. Um, in states that are currently not on lockdown and are still doing test and trace, we need to prioritize those states still. Um, and and those, still, those states even themselves don't have good testing and tracing in places because there's not enough tests available. So hopefully in the next month or two, um, we'll have enough tests. And, and from my perspective, that should be the single biggest criteria uh, in terms of when this lockdown should end when we have enough tests available, both RNA tests and antibody tests, to be able to test and treat, uh, or rather test and or test and trace efficiently. Um, what, once those two things are done, then we can lock, we can re remove the lockdown. Before then, it's really going to be risky because we'll still be playing um, blind whack-a-mole, blindfold, blindfolded whack-a-mole. All right. Um, I think there were some other questions. I don't know. Uh, let's see. I'm just reading what might be on here. <clears throat> How active is the collaboration between researchers in different countries and also at different companies? That is, are possible lead shares with each other in real time? Yes, the answer is yes, definitely yes. Um, I'm part of a couple of listservs, or I guess they're not called listservs now anymore, but like on Facebook and, and other groups uh, where epidemiologists around the world, some epidemiologists I haven't talked to in years, are sharing uh, studies that they're doing and sharing data sets that they're creating all across the world. So there is enormous, um, enormous collaboration across the world, across the country and across the world. Um, that is not the limiting factor here. The limiting factor right now is a, po is a policy issue, a po political issue, rather than an um, epidemiology collaboration issue. It used to be, I think it's probably still the case today, that there are a shortage of epidemiologists in the world. Uh, so for, for any kids out there, or any people who are into, trying to figure out what they want to do with the rest of their lives, and they're in school right now, this is a really great opportunity. There, I think people to this day still say there are 
two or three epidemiology positions available for every epidemiologist out there. So it's really good op opportunity, regardless of whether there's an epidemic or not. Uh, epidemiologists are in high demand for those positions for the types of of um, evaluations that we do. So whether it's being involved in clinical trials, or being involved in um, forecasting disease trends, or being involved in 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 working to evaluate the distribution and determinants of diseases um, around the world, uh, many different kinds of diseases. There are many many opportunities out there. Doctors are also very necessary. <laughs> Doctors are certainly necessary. You know, it's interesting. I was talking the other day with someone. <clears throat> so Aristotle, um, the Greek philosopher, uh, scientist, he, he once made the comparison that in the same way that science is sort of theoretical and engineering is sort of applied science, he made the comparison that philosophy is kind of theoretical and law was sort of applied philosophy in terms of logic, in terms of looking at relationships between things. And what's interesting is that epidemiology is sort of the medicine, is sort of the science of medicine. And so whenever you think about clinical trials, that's epidemiology. Whenever you look at population level studies on health, that's epidemiology. There are other sources of, of information that inform these things. So for instance, virology and biology and molecular biology and, and lots of other things, lab science, animal studies that go into informing medical science. But ultimately, the, the best tests that we have, that's all epidemiology. And so what this means is that medical doctors are applied in terms of what the, what the thinking is and what the best philosophy of, of, of medical science is. It's sort of the applied version of that. So what you hear from a doctor is typically based on guidelines based that are developed. It's basically tipped on, on uh, based, uh, it's based, based on best practices that you might have. But doctors have to use their best judgment um, in terms of how they're treating a patient in front of them. In contrast, epidemiologists might be, digger, might be deeper in the weeds looking at the sum of evidence. And we might have maybe even advanced knowledge looking at Lots, of, lots more publications that are out there, lots more trials that are underway. So our focus is really, we're trained to really understand and interpret and, and contribute to the best practices in looking at method, methodological approaches to different uh, studies that are published and sort of how to interpret those studies in the context of other studies. That is not the primary training of medical doctors. Medical doctors might only have a single class in epidemiology in their whole medical training. They know a lot about reading a clinical trial and sort of interpreting it, but that's not their primary focus. Their primary focus is in treating patients. And so for them, they'll be sued by the insurance company if they don't follow the guidelines and they don't follow what's seen as standard of care typically. Whereas an epidemiologist is not under that constraint because we are not treating people unless you have this dual degree and, and are doing both. But we are really thinking at the higher level, at the sum of evidence. What's all the data available? How do we look at conflicting data out there based on interpreting the methods that were used and the biases that might have been present in the studies and things like this? They're very different skill sets in terms of interpreting it. So when we look at physicians or medical doctors giving advice, that's important. They're on the ground treating these things. But then when you look at epidemiologists who are looking at the evidence, the sum of evidence they're looking at and in their interpretation might be somewhat different. And so hopefully the overlap is strong, but they are two different skill sets. All right, there are other questions. Let me continue going down some lists. <clears throat> All right, so what protective measure measures should people take when leaving home? the supermarket or going to the pharmacy, for instance. Um, so I would say <clears throat> that this should be risk dependent. Um, the higher the risk to the individual, the more the protection should be. Like I, you know, if 80 year olds can somehow get by without leaving their house at all. So for instance, if they have someone do their food shopping for them or have it delivered, that would be ideal. Um, so people at the highest risk really shouldn't be leaving their house for any reason at all. 
unless they're walking around the block, they don't have to worry about, um, like if they're in the suburbs, for instance, or rural areas, if they don't have to worry that, that there's going to be many people within six to 10 feet, then yeah, get your exercise and it's okay to leave. Um, but um, they shouldn't be going out shopping. They shouldn't be going out food shopping. Um, so we, so people who are younger need to be helping them if we can. If they can't get food delivered, we should be doing their food shopping for them and, and whatnot. For people who are younger and at higher risk, if someone's in their 40s with a high risk condition, then they personally shouldn't be leaving the house, uh, probably. But um, they uh, remember the risk is at the household level. So anyone who gets sick increases the risk of that person getting sick. Having said that, if someone does leave the house and gets sick, it doesn't mean that the, per the other person in the house will get sick. The person is at the household is at increased risk of getting, pardon me, of getting sick, but doesn't mean that they certainly will. So, like I said, right now many states are looking at two days prior to symptoms and as when uh, this could, uh, uh, the spread could start. But really, the it's it's sort of like a, a um, increased probability that peaks over time, and so the peak in likelihood of spreading the virus after the symptoms have already started. So the probability before the symptoms are not as high versus when you've had the symptoms for a day or a few days. And so therefore, if someone needs to go out food shopping, it should be the person who's, who's, who's an adult who's probably at the, at the lowest risk because then it's still one step removed, even though it's in the household from the other people. But if they do get it, then they can sort of remove themselves and that would still be another block from, the, um, from other people in the house getting it. But it's, it's really tough living in a household to prevent other people. Use the same to uh, bathrooms and kitchens and whatnot. Um, but in terms of what precautions you should use, definitely social distancing, um, try not to touch things that other people are touching. Um, <clears throat> it is a respiratory virus. Um, we do know that aerosols can form, which means that it's uh, microscopic droplets that might be out there, so you wouldn't even see it, people just breathing. But at the same time, um, like I said, you know what I said earlier, that it's not over the course of a month of these people, some of these people who are really sick, the average number of people that they're infecting is not 20 or 50 other people. The average number of people being infected during the whole course of illness, from first being infected to being, um, to recovering, is typically only around three or less. So, so that means that if you go out to the supermarket, you are not really very likely to get it. You have to be wise. Maybe wear a mask if you get it. If you don't have a mask, don't worry too much about it. Your risk is not really that high. <clears throat> um, gloves, same kind of thing. Gloves, I, you know, gloves, I wouldn't even bother with gloves. Here's the problem with gloves. If you wear gloves and you're still touching your face, then anything that you touched, whether it was a doorknob or, or another person shaking their hand or whatever, if you touch your face, then it's irrelevant whether you're wearing a glove or not. Um, and so the glove offers zero protection for you. Typically in a, in a healthcare facility, people who wear gloves are taking their gloves off after every single person that they see and putting fresh gloves on. So if you're wearing a glove throughout the day, it does zero benefit for you. So don't, don't even bother with the gloves. Um, I mean, unless, okay, here's the one instance. If you are crazily washing your hands multiple times a day, and your hands are starting to get like really red and sore because you're washing it so much, then maybe wear gloves and then you could wash the gloves. Not, don't take the gloves off and wash them. I mean, just wash, continue washing your hands with the gloves on. But most of the time, anyone who's in lockdown, you don't need to be washing your hands so much because you're in lockdown. So you're not really at risk of exposure. That's the whole point. So even then, like people who are taking Purell at home and are constantly putting Purell on when they're in lockdown, if you're not exposed to other people, you don't have to be putting Purell on all the time because your exposure is really low. All right, having said that, I realize it is 10 after three. So um, maybe we can look at one other question and then we can close it off. <clears throat> I have, we can check. Protective measures. Ken, do you have any other intriguing issues or questions or answers? No, I think the only thing left here that we didn't ask is the only thing to fear, fear itself. Um, that's a good wrap up. Yeah, so this is a really tricky issue. So I'm 
I'm not trying not to get too into politics here, but there are is a political strain out there in our, in the United States, not just in the United States, around, in other countries too, but particularly in the U.S. that is saying we don't have to fear anything. In fact, the president himself said um, that it was a hoax that having so much fear that this could get bad was actually a hoax. Like he literally said that uh, maybe a month ago or so. And and so that's the idea that the only thing to fear is fear itself. The problem is that's not the case with this virus. This virus is actually killing people. We have good reasons for being on lockdown because we're trying to prevent the fatality rate going to three, four percent or more um, in terms of exceeding the capacity of our healthcare facilities. Um, unfortunately, some of the people who have been claiming this have succumbed to the virus itself already. And there are some states that are still following this idea that the only thing to fear is fear itself because the economic consequences, and they have different policies in place than we have in New Jersey and New, the New York City metro area. And so what that means, the virus doesn't care about policies. The virus doesn't care about ideologies. The virus burns through a population and only is constrained by testing and tracing and, and quarantining those who are sick um, and until we have treatments that are available. And so what this means is that policies really do make a difference. When you look across the globe, you can see that. There are many countries that are doing a really, really well, not many, but a handful that are doing really, really well. Singapore and South Korea, China now, China, the data is a little bit hazy, but it's, it's, they seem to be doing okay. Some other countries, Japan seems to be doing well. Um, and that's because they are doing test and trace and they're diagnosing like crazy those that are that are sick and they're tracing it um here we if we're if some states are not testing and tracing sufficiently because they fear they say oh the, it's, there's nothing to fear but fear itself then we know just because it's a virus and human beings are animals just based on what we know about infections we know that the virus will spread and just burn through those those areas and it's it's unfortunate and I'm trying to keep politics out of it, but there's only so much we can do. And my worry is that what we might find is that come the fall, you might have way more people who have died in some of these areas that think there's nothing to fear but fear itself because they haven't implemented what we know works uh, versus the New York City area or other areas where we care a lot about the people who live here. Um, so I'll, I'll just, unless you have anything to add, Ken, I'll just end there. Thank you. Ken, thank you very much uh, for joining. I really appreciate it. Everyone who's been on the line, I really appreciate you joining. Um, if you have other questions, uh, I think we've talked about quite a lot, but there's so much more we could have talked about. Um, if there's other questions, maybe we can do this again sometime. Otherwise, enjoy your weekend and uh, talk to you all online. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.